Hello and welcome to today's Wired Briefing, um, a new way of thinking. I'm Jeremy White, I'm Executive Editor at Wired UK. Uh, in today's briefing, we'll be exploring the extraordinary journey of an inventor and see how they can achieve the seemingly un unimaginable. Long before we became obsessed with superheroes, human beings have dreamed of flying outside the confines of an aircraft, not by extending a fall with parachutes or hang gliders or wingsuits, but actually flying. I'm delighted to be joined today by Richard Browning, the founder and chief test pilot of Gravity Industries, an inventor of the world's fastest personal jet suit. Since launching Gravity four years ago, Browning has taken off thousands of times, uh, performed live demonstrations in more than 30 countries and set a Guinness World Record twice and accrued more than 10 million YouTube views for his exploits. Not bad for a Royal Marine Reservist, a former oil trader of 16 years with British Petroleum, and for someone who manages to secure $650,000 of funding for the jet suit in a parking lot in San Francisco. Browning also managed to achieve all this despite scare, uh, having a fear of heights as a child. Richard, welcome. It's great to have you with us today, sir. Thanks, Jeremy. Pleasure to be here. Um, we'll be taking some questions from our audience today, as usual. So if you'd like to ask Richard something, then please use the Q&A function on your screens at any point, and we'll try to answer as many of these uh, questions as possible. Uh, what we're going to do is go through the session uh, in this sort of format here. So we're going to try and outline the story of gravity and also the jet suit itself. Um, just briefly, we're going to talk about how it's actually being used in areas that you never thought uh, possible. Uh, then the development of the project for the future. and key learnings or key sort of recommendations that can be applicable to any industry going forward. So let's start with the, the why, why we actually got into here, Richard. So um, the, the Royal Marines experience, you know, you, you've talked about how that led to the start of the jet suit. And if you could, if you could reimagine uh, human flight uh, rather than sort of sit inside a vehicle, you know, how close you could get the human body to that experience of, of being the machine. What was interesting, though, is that many people might know that your father was uh, an engineer involved in aeronautics itself. It, is, did this sort of dream of this actually start way back then as well? Did you ever think about it when you were a, ch a child? I, my father was definitely a big influence on me in this area, sort of unbeknown to me. I, I mean, I didn't as a child kind of aspire to fly like a superhero or anything, nothing, nothing of the sort, really. But I did spend many happy hours building little model aircraft, the kind of balsa wood and tissue paper type ones back in the day, which seems very ancient now. Uh, and then I sort of graduated on in my, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 year old years uh, to those very simple slope soaring radio controlled ones. You know, if you, all you had is the rudder and the elevator, again, extremely crude, but very satisfying to build something, throw it off a hill and then just silently swoosh up and down for hours. Um, I suppose uh, subconsciously picking up a massive passion for flight and, you know, uh, and, and, you know, I, I suppose that passion for building an idea and then seeing it actually perform um, must have been, you know, must have left its mark on me. So, yeah, that and his background, my grandfather, one grandfather was uh, Sir Basil Blackpool, used to run Westland helicopters. And my other grandfather was a wartime aviator as well. So genuinely, none of this really dawned on me until I've gone through, you know, four years of interviews over, you know, since we launched uh, launched Gravity. And it sort of did did uh yes arrived in my mind that actually i had all of these ingredients sitting there and the 16 years as an oil trader uh admittedly with that royal marines time alongside it was a little bit of an aberration in some ways but the royal marines as you rightly mentioned was a big part of the inspiration behind believing this ludicrous idea that you yourself as a human could be the flight structure and use your brain as the flight balance system we we in this world are increasingly drawn towards just putting an uh you know an ecu a chip or whatever in to solve the problem all the time and actually it's quite nice that you take a step back and and recognize just how elegant the human machine is for let's say even riding a bike or surfing or skiing or snowboarding all of those activities are ludicrously complex and yet you often can pick them up within you know a, a number of hours with this um sort of situation what i wanted to do, uh, understand actually uh, from developing a system like this is obviously it requires an in incredible amount of perseverance and drive to actually get somewhere through to this, uh, through to this sort of thing. So I imagine there are a number of people. You would assume actually there are a number of people that have tried to do develop a technology as this, but they uh, or they haven't actually. 
And like, or are there assumptions where people have te- where people assume that you cannot develop this sort of technology or it'll just be too difficult? What what was the you know was it was that the case for you? You just did you look into this into the developing the jet suit technology, expecting people to have already taken the thought process further than they actually had? Yeah, this whole area is kind of fascinating, right? That that if you're a creative, uh, an engineer, a designer, an artist, you know, you, you are in the business of doing things deliberately that haven't been done before and therein lies risk because actually if it was a good idea already then it would already be already be being done if it hasn't been done but the outcome is still quite interesting and desirable then the reason it hasn't been done is because the conventional wisdom suggests it's too difficult too expensive not feasible i'm always fascinated by those things though because one time in 20 is a very rough approximate non-scientific number um, I find that the conventional wisdom is wrong. Annoyingly, 19 out of the 20, and they might might be in that order, um, everybody else is right and you're an idiot. But I, I'm not really put off by the setbacks. I've had enough lucky breaks as a, you know, in my career and even childhood of getting familiar with what it takes to be relentless and ruthless, but also then go and pull back and try something different, all in the pursuit of the seemingly fantasy idea that you might go and break that convention so yes in the case of what we do i mean i'm surrounded by them sitting here you know th- th- this was considered by the conventional air aviation industry as you're never going to be able to carry enough fuel you're not going to be able to you know somehow hold the hold the thrust i mean what kind of aircraft do you hold onto the engine on a, an outboard motor on a boat you don't give it a hug you know it's attached to the boat and you do a little bit of steering you know no idiot we're going to actually hold the engines uh, somehow surely it's going to rip your arms off there is the gyroscopic moment. If you spin a bicycle wheel and hold it by the hub, everybody, well, not everybody, a lot of people have experienced that very peculiar feeling when you manipulate it and it fights you. Well, at 120,000 RPM, those spindles are going to have something to say inside those engines if you try to manipulate them. So, of course, that will make it impossible. The heat, the, the, um, uh, you know, the heat is going to set fire to everything and burn you to the ground. You know, it's going to be far too dangerous, too difficult, all the rest of it. Actually, it turns out all of those are not a problem because if you actually get your hands dirty, metaphorically, and go try and go and experiment in a very safe and considered way where you've analyzed what is the worst that can happen and that's you know that's manageable turns out those aren't problems i mean you know they are all tackleable and manageable the gyroscopic ones hilarious i mean you just feel absolutely nothing if you fire at one of these engines with a straight arm and then manipulate it around and move it around there is no force acting on you other than a static push which feels frankly the same as leading on a desk the static force of leaning on a surface can be entirely replicated by the static force of these engines once they're up to speed. That's absolutely fascinating. So if I may ask you to elaborate on what, what, what if those parts weren't tricky to overcome, which parts were? Well, I, I, when you say they're not tricky to overcome. Oh, no, I beg your pardon. To get to the point of proving that they were manageable and workable, you know, you had to go out there and construct experiments that would allow you to prove that so i'm you know standing in a country lane with one engine strapped to my arm that, that film is out there it's part of a lot of the talks i do in the ted talk um the main one uh and that was a really fundamental moment because it just felt like this this fire hose of push it wasn't flailing around like a you know, like a like a garden hose it wasn't trying to talk my arm off uh, but actually working through all of those and dismissing those assumptions or working with the challenges you know the, the heat is not a problem obviously if you point them at something for a long period of time that could be a problem but i mean that's a crude example of showing how you work with that you don't do that um but actually the heat is not really a problem you can swipe the thrust at full power across a gene clad leg if you were stupid enough and it doesn't do anything because this air has a very low specific heat capacity and doesn't impart much energy if you if it's only momentary anyway um to go through and arrive at all these conclusions and especially arrive at something within nine seven eight months whatever it was um that would actually fly back in 2016 took a huge amount of perseverance a lot of hours and i suppose a lot of persistence to cling to the vision that i had which I didn't even bother explaining this to very many people because it still sounds mad when you describe it today. Uh, and I just thought, you know what, it's up to me to go and turn this concept into something that works because even I'm not that convinced it's necessarily going to work, but I'm sure as hell going to try and get to the end and prove that it does or doesn't. It's, a, you, it's sort of tr- you, tr- you mentioned perseverance in passing there, but that's, you know, it's a huge word. And also it's something like this is massive to undertake. And obviously the years that it's taken to develop it in such an iterative manner, where does, where does this perseverance come from for you? It's not something, is it, is it something that's uh, from, from your family? Is it something from your background? Is it something innate within yourself? 
Is it something that you apply to other parts of your life as well? Or is it just this particular project has driven something inside you? Yeah, I, I mean, I should pause, and say, pause for a minute and say that, that there's a very unhelpful reflection here when it comes to the entrepreneurial journey, that one minute you need all the perseverance in the world and never say die and never give up. And, you know, it's almost quite sort of militaristic in that way, you know, never, never give up, keep striving for the top of the hill. And then in the same heartbeat, decide that actually that idea has now presented you with enough evidence that it's not a good plan, drop the whole thing unemotionally, turn to one side and walk down another path. Uh, that is really hard to do, very easy to describe. There is no rule book on when you reach that moment. The best example is running a trading book. You know, people are familiar with stocks and shares and things like that. I mean, my, my world was the oil industry, but the same principle applies. You know, you, you come up with a strategy, a bunch of trades represent that strategy, and then suddenly the outside conditions change and you might have to scrap the whole lot. Just because you've lost some money and you hope it might come back isn't a good enough reason to just cling to it. That's an inappropriate application of perseverance. If so I want to kind of make that point. It's not just dogged, blind uh, perseverance by itself. Yeah, where does it come from? I mean, I, I, think, I think a large part of it comes from the experience of, of being around my father. He gave up a perfectly good day job to go and pursue this entrepreneurial journey around bicycle suspension. And he pioneered somewhat mountain bike suspension, which is something that's just sort of commonplace nowadays. It's hard to find a mountain bike without suspension. But back in the day, that was a peculiar idea. Um, he had all the engineering capability and skill and all of that drive and determination. He just lacked some of the business experience that I probably got my commercial career to thank for. And it was a very tough external environment. And it ultimately cost him his own life um, on that journey when I was about 15. So that was the mother of all examples of persevering and yet not quite getting it over the line. So I think my own bit of self-analytics is, I think, part of my determination to take ideas to their fruition their culmination point uh is to try and make good that that i never quite saw achieved when i was um you know when i was 15 i think that's my own little bit of sort of self oprah moment <laughs> um again through the medium of many interviews i've sort of concluded that must be where it comes from otherwise i don't know really with the regards to actually developing the the the, the jetpack itself and the this idea about whether it would be acceptable i um I imagine just from the timelines involved here that you started thinking about this way before we had this, you know, this wave of superhero euphoria, massive box office success from Marvel and DC and things like that. And what was was the uh, I mean, like the, the, there's a very sort of attitude where some people might consider this sort of avenue of endeavor being somewhat silly or somewhat childish or like chasing after some sort of childhood dream. But then also you can see you can point towards this huge interest with the sort of this sort of superhuman endeavor in the in the in the wider media landscape. And uh, I was wondering whether that helped or hindered really this sort of it, it, did, it, did it or did it arrive too late for you? So, yeah, very disappointingly for many uh, interviewers, I, I wasn't a kid that had any interest at all in superheroes or plastic figures or anything like that. I was kind of weirdly boring in that sense. I just like, you know, building more practical things or taking things apart. But, uh, and when I embarked on this journey, I absolutely was not trying to build an Iron Man suit. I mean, that was not, I didn't watch the film and think, oh, I've got to try and build that. Although I must say the first film with the, you know, building a diversity in a cave and I like that, um, but it was not the motivation for doing this. Um, as it became more and more competent behind the scenes, it did dawn on a few people who came to see it, that that was their only go-to analogy it's like oh my god this looks a bit like a sort of some sort of marvel superhero thing and to be clear i was on this journey with no practical purpose whatsoever no commercial idea i just thought it would be an amazing challenge if it would work and then we'd see what happens and this is all alongside my day job having now flown in the us you know before covid mostly um at least 20 25 times out of our 140 events in 35 countries i one of them was comic-con and i flew there and everybody went kind of mad and it did dawn on me that in the UK particularly, and let's just scoop the rest of Europe into that as well, there is a bit of an attitude towards, you know, DC and Marvel comic books. It's all a bit sort of slightly creepy grown-ups in spandex and whatever. And, you know, it's great, it entertains the kids, but that's it. In the US, particularly in California, there is this attitude that actually, if you distill pure human creativity and pure human drive to achieve the impossible, you know, be super strong or super fast or have a little flip out piece of plastic that allows me to talk to anybody in the world or answer any question that I might have that's ever been thought of. They, they tend to represent, um, or, or you know, the, the, the comic book genre, if you like, represents that pure human creativity and drive and desire where you don't care about money or physics. That comes later. Let's just imagine we can do that. 
So when you think about it, it's actually like a rich source of inspiration. And as I hinted there with the phone, mobile phone, that's witchcraft 30 years ago, maybe 40 now. Uh, uh, you know, and yet we've gone and achieved it because it represented an amazing, you know, the, the Star Trek flip out kite, the quote, that kind of thing, represented a genuine human interest. Like, wouldn't it be cool if we could speak to somebody orbiting the planet? So actually, I've got a, I've got a slightly not British and slightly more open minded attitude towards that now. And it, it does. I mean, we run with it. If people think it looks like a superhero thing, that's very flattering in a way because they they're all breaking most of the laws of physics. And we're trying to creep our way, not to breaking laws of physics, but creep our way towards that kind of capability. You know, and some of the kit around me now starts up from cold in 15 seconds and you can fly a couple of kilometers in less than two minutes. You know, that's getting pretty good, really. If, I, I'm interested what you said, uh, uh, of what you said just at the start of that answer about how you, there was no particular application you had in mind when you started on this particular journey. And that's fascinating. History is replete with inventions being created where at least the, you know, the eventual uh, application was not what was originally envisaged whatsoever. Uh, SMS text message, for example, were created to test phone lines uh, for the telecoms operators and end up becoming one of the major gen revenue generating parts of their business. Is that's just one example that springs to mind? I'm interested what you what you know what how you felt the applications for you know what has happened since the jet suit has been created. What applications do you have for it? And and what future applications do you envisage for it? So you know, let's start with sort of applications that you that you've got for it first, and and then move on to what it could be used for in your in your mind's eye now. Yeah, certainly. So the, the, as I said, the desire was just to do something that was considered largely not really possible, and then see what happened. And having done it, it it just seemed to kind of I don't know pickle people's minds when they saw a human being sort of pick up and fly around. It was it was quite crazy to watch people's reactions in fact the very first person that, this, that properly manifested it was my, was my mother-in-law who is the last person in the world to get excited about anything to do with superheroes and literally came up and gave me a hug with kind of tears in her eyes when she first saw it i don't think it was just the fumes and the noise it was just the the representation of seeing a human do something which i don't think your human experience ever usually sees and now having done this as i say for well over 140 events uh, all over the world the reaction is the same. It seems to unlock some real passion in most people who see it. So having run with that, with, you know, we did that, did TED 2017 uh, and did a flight there. Uh, we just got invited to do events all over the world. So from a business point of view, this started to generate really good revenue and yet also started to let us experiment with what, what is this? What does this mean to people? You know, is it a superhero? Is it a new form of mobility? Is it, you know, and, and if I distill four years forward, we now have a really successful business. We haven't raised money since that 2017 parking lot accidental raise. Uh, we've, and I've been very passionate about this. We've generated all our own revenue since then because it's a great feedback loop on proving we are adding value to somebody doing something and therefore we'll do more of that rather than just go off down a VC funded route that might prove to only impress that VC and nobody else. So we've got an amazing business split into two. One is around entertainment and that is everything from doing events to doing client training we've just trained over 500 people now at goodwood in the us as well um uh, and we're building out an electric trainer as well we do everything from branded events to um uh, you know adverts in china for you know hyundai through to uh, dell and uh, you, you name it we've done a, an advert for various people which is great because we often get to go and fly in really interesting locations and learn more about the robustness of the equipment in those unusual locations the other division is what we're calling the professional division, which is paramedic mobility and special forces mobility. So again, a lot of people have the seen paramedic this. stuff. The paramedic stuff sounds. Yeah. I love this idea, this of life-saving capability of the technology. Tell us about that. Yeah, so people might remember that there's a film that went out about a year ago with us flying around the Lake District, uh, and that was an invitation from the Great North Air Ambulance to come up and show what we could do. I really didn't know much about that world, but we went up there anyway and had a go. And it turned out that when you've got a casualty, whether it's a slip, trip or a fall or a cardiac uh, problem or something like that, up on the hills, the only way to get to them is usually drive a Land Rover to the bottom of the valley and then hike up to that person. OK, you can call it call a helicopter, but they tend to circle around, struggle to find the casualty. And even if they do, they tend to land down in the valley and walk back up again. So actually, if you can deploy something out of those Land Rovers when you run out of road and get quickly up the terrain to where that person is, especially in a cardiac case or if they're bleeding badly, you can genuinely save lives. And this, this was the conviction of the uh, paramedics there. So we did the exercise and the summary was I got to the casualty in 90 seconds when it took 25 minutes to walk there. And we just repeated the exercise in Dartmoor 
only a couple of months back. It's on YouTube and the Gravity Industries YouTube is there as well. And that was even more stark. I mean, that was, I think, a 30 odd minute walk. And I did again in under 90 seconds. I think it was about 75 seconds. So if you think of the best analogy is think about a motorbike, paramedic motorbike going through the you know, city streets to get to a casualty. They're not going to take you back on the back of the motorbike to hospital. They're going to stabilize the casualty and buy those valuable hours of stability in order to work out what the best thing is to do after that. And that turns out what we can do. What about um, the future development of the technology itself? Um, you're on Mark sort of 2.5 or I think 2.5 of the of the suit right now. Um, uh, and the fuel system you have for it, you're thinking of changing as well. So what, what's, what will the future versions of the jet suit look like? If you can give us a window into that. Yeah, I mean, we, we never slow down. I mean, I'm surrounded by various different prototypes that we're working on at the moment. It's, it's kind of what is the real passion behind the scenes. It's relentlessly improving this technology, having proven that, that it works. And it's a rich kind of opportunity set out there in terms of all the things we can do that we haven't done yet. So, yeah, we're actually on the Mark III. Not that anybody's seen that yet, but that's got a lot more power. That does the 15 second start up from cold, which is pretty crazy. Uh, it lifts an extra 20 kilos. You can scale the suit. Essentially, you scale each engine very slightly and it generates a lot more lift. So, you know, if you've got a 120 kilo US Marine with a load of gear, then that's still possible. We traditionally haven't built them that powerful because we, we like to have them pack into civilian suitcases because it just means you can go anywhere in the world. We're off to Brazil next week, just came back from Dubai. Um, in terms of other major improvements, we built an electric version. Um, one of my team led that and we revealed it at the Goodwood Festival of Speed a few months back. It's a starting point. It is twice the weight of a jet suit and it lasts for about 15 seconds. And we did put our skinniest team member or one of our CAD designers in that. He's a very good pilot, but he's very light. Uh, he literally had to empty his pockets in order to get off the ground. And I'm not joking about that. He didn't in the first test. Um, so, but look, it's a starting point. Everybody knows that electric planes, for instance, are a lovely desire, but they get really hard. We've got two Teslas we run and, you know, they're damn heavy, but very capable. As the world delivers better batteries, then we are ready to transition to that as much as we can. In the meantime, we can run, run biojet or biodiesel. Um, and we have done before. It's quite hard to get, unfortunately. We don't burn really very much at all. We usually, I think we've offset more fuel than we'd usually burn at an event by not driving a petrol or gasoline car to the event in most cases. Um, but yeah, it, everything's improving massively. All of this is 3D printed. All of it is extremely organic to the human. Uh, it, it's very easy to put on and take off. It really is constantly striving to be that natural augmentation to you rather than a machine that you're kind of, you know, having to sit in or on or anything. One thing I think we should try and move us on to is, is lessons. I mean, this, this is an enormous amount of lessons that you've learned or sort of experiences you've been through on this journey. But the is how these are actually applicable for, for industries that are completely separate to what you're involved in whatsoever. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is that um, is that do I imagine big corporates will come to you and say, well, you know, you're, uh, you know, a reason, a relatively smaller sized operation, and you have the luxury of being able to iterate quickly and to, to decide things very fast and actually, you know, be bold in your decisions on what you actually do in terms of innovation within your business. And we can't do that. So, I mean, what would you, what are your, is your reply in that sort of regard? And how, how can your lessons here be relevant to big corporations, for example? Yeah, I, I, and we, we're increasingly getting involved in what you describe here because, you know, I have got 16 years working in a big corporate, albeit in, a, in an innovative pocket within that corporate. But I did have a long history of shaking the apple cart a bit. Um, I accidentally generated a ship tracking trading system ahead of the rest of the competition with about $30,000 that I willingly borrowed from the organization and it made half a billion within nine months uh, because I just was kind of my normal self of asking why and not really giving up a bit. And it turned out that you could predict all the flows, all the trade flows um, uh, on these um, oil trading vessels. And it's a sort of Google Maps type map system and changed the way that commodity trading worked. And we just, I just gave our organization a, a head start. If you go on any commodity floor, you'll see exactly this system being used, you know, mainstream there. That arguably had big, a bigger impact than building jet suits. Um, but it's the same behavior set, which is to quickly look at a scenario apply an almost childlike curiosity of, uh, and a complete disregard for people telling you that things can't be done or just shouldn't work like that or whatever, being curious as to why not. And then there is a very important and very grown up 
rule set that I used to apply running a trading book and we still apply to everything we do now, which is that you know, innovation is all about risk. It's all about taking a risk with something that's not been done before, otherwise you're not innovating. Risk, especially in a corporate setting, is just shunned and run away from and it's sought to be eliminated, which is a lovely desire. But by doing that, you create an existential risk of not keeping up with the competition. But I'll pause that thought for a minute. If you're going to take that risk in order to innovate, the simple rule is manage what happens when that risk manifests. In other words, when stuff goes wrong, when it goes wrong, are you able to get back up again, in our case, physically, from a safety reputation and financial perspective? Or is it going to be catastrophic or overly damaging? If it's overly damaging, you can't recover from it, then just don't do it. If it's, as in most cases, entirely recoverable and manageable, do it now. Don't schedule it for a sort of board meeting in six months time. And, and that kind of ethos allows you to very rapidly work through ideas and discover things you never imagined you would have discovered had you not embarked down that journey. So I think that skill set, that rule set of making innovation something that isn't a scary risk generator, but is actually a survival mechanism, is something that applies to no matter how big the organization is. And as I go back to that point I made earlier, if you don't do this, you will be redundant as an organization or an entity, or even maybe even as an individual, you know, in what, two, five, 10 years time, you know, in the case of the oil industry, keeping up with the demands of the world for clean energy, in the case of the militaries we work with, you know, not being competitive, uh, not keeping up with the threats as they evolve outside, it applies to all of them. I'm just going to, I'm conscious we could talk for ages, actually, I'm just conscious we're already running out of time. I want to bring in some of the questions from the audience here that are watching you now. Um, so um, one of them was here is, you know, any advice or the biggest learnings for someone starting a new business where nothing else in the world exists like like that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's us, isn't it, really? I mean, I, I would say be that split personality of one minute, never say die and just, you know, it's going to take that. You're, you're going to have to be relentless in, and, and obsessive in your pursuit of the delivery of it. But at the same time, be your own biggest critic inside. Do listen to other people who also have got critical ideas. Don't just dismiss them. Don't be blind to it. And, you know, beat up your own conviction. And actually, just like that trading analogy, if the conditions change outside, don't just stick wedded to your position, determine that you can't afford for it now not to be right. That's terrible. You know, you've got to just quickly pull back, cut your losses, and then change direction. You know, running a small business is, is like that a lot. You know, you, you often change direction quite significantly when the conditions change. So yeah, it, it's hard. There's no black and white rule to decide between perseverance and direction change. And I think another one here would be, was um, another good example here. We've covered, uh, they have been asking about what next for the future. I think we've, I think we've covered that to a little, some degree, but um, I wanted to ask someone saying, how do you, when you achieve what you've had, and obviously as gravity becomes more and more of a business entity and you know, a corporate, a corporate thinking that as well, how do you stay creative working out what you want to look to achieve next yeah i think a lot of it's about small teams i i kind of noticed that as you get very large organizations i mean we're 20 odd people or so but as you get large organizations where you as an individual struggle to have a relationship with every single person that's where you introduce layers and that's where politics comes in and and, and you know dilution of messaging and all that kind of stuff there are some quite nice like examples out there um i think it's north face for instance you know the clothing company i think they hive off their organizations when they get over like 80 100 people they sort of carve them out and put them out as a separate team that's all very flat and self-managing uh, i think that's quite neat i think as soon as you've got thousands of people you end up with you know a large number of them doing nothing other than managing those people and that's where it all starts to go wrong um so yeah that would be my thought on that Excellent. Thank you very much. We actually have lots of other questions, but we are out of time as, a, as a, unfortunately we could actually speak for a lot longer. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you for your time today and sharing your insight. If you enjoyed the session, please do check out the other episodes of the Wire Briefings at wire.co.uk. I want to say a final thank you to Richard and to everyone watching the session. Thank you. Stay well, and we'll see you soon. Thanks very much.